بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احنا what we're going to do in this 90 minutes is to go through the uh, surgery of the fecal lenses ICL in special how many of you are doing ICL in this room good that like 20% how many of you are thinking of doing ICL in the future yeah, okay that's that, that makes sense now uh, we want to make it as interactive as possible I prepared a set of slides, very nice slides, but I don't care presenting them. All what we want to do is to use the slides as a guide for discussion. So I want you to talk, to interrupt me anytime we have full 90 minutes. So we need to answer all the questions, make it as interactive as possible, so speak loud. There are no uh, 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 questions that are simple. Whatever comes to your mind, just ask, discuss, and we have too many uh, ICL experts, Dr. Talal is one of them, Dr. Mihi, Dr. Ahmad, Kulina. We have many experts in this room, so we can share information. Michel Hadaf in Noana, just to keep talking. Type any questions? <laughs> I, I'm consulting for NIDEC. Oh, Star, Star is the manufacturer of ICL. Uh, it had nothing to do with this presentation, but I, uh, I disclose my uh, relation now. Um, now, over many years, we know, we knew, we learned long time ago that FECEC intraocular lenses have many advantages over laser refractive search. And we knew this actually in 1992, and I'm quoting here the late uh, George Waring when he was working at our hospital in Jeddah. We were doing LASIK at that time, before it was called LASIK, it was called FLAP and ZAP and all these kind of uh, uh, weird names. Uh, and everybody in the Europe and the United States were talking about laser as the future. We were already doing LASIK for many years. So I told him, you know, George, I'm very happy you are here in, in the Middle East. We are doing LASIK now. And everybody there is speaking about LASIK as the future. Then he told me, no, Allah, you're wrong. For us, LASIK or laser surgery is the present. But the future is fake lenses. Uh, uh, I never uh, forget this because this what happened 20 years later we are now in the future and I think he was absolutely right. Uh, fake lenses have many advantages over, over corneal refractive surgery. I'm not going to go into this because you all know that it doesn't change the cornea, it doesn't change the quality of vision. Uh, you're not creating oblate corneas, aberrations are much better, quality of vision is much better. So we're not going to go into this because I'm sure all of you know it very well. Uh, last 10 years, we had a big debate, which fecic intraocular lens, anterior chamber lenses, iris fixated lenses, uh, or angle supported lenses, or posterior chamber lenses. And there, there was very nice, lovely, active, dynamic debate. And we are doing a course at the SCRS for now 15 years Fake IOL, it's a classic course on fake IOLs. And we are all, always, we were enjoying the debates between speakers. Uh, I remember in this course, 15 years ago, I was speaking for the artisan lens. Others were speaking for the IC, and now we changed seats. But uh, today we have difficulty in finding speakers who can speak for the angle fixated lenses. Actually, no one. Uh, uh, it's difficult to find speakers who uh, speak for the iris fixated lenses for many reasons. Today the debate is over and we know that the posterior chamber lens is the best uh, place to put a fecic lens. The, now there are few, but I'm sure in the near future, in the very near future, many companies will come with the posterior chamber lenses. I know uh, now there is the ICL well established, there is the PRL which is uh, suffering a little bit because they do not have a toric design. Uh, I, I know at least two companies in India are uh, man started to manufacture and they already launched their posterior chamber lenses, uh, but in a different material. And this will make the difference in the future, the material. It's not the position. Now, we know that posterior chamber lenses are the best. Now, are the best. now the question is, which is the best posterior chamber lens? This will be the debate in the for the next 10 years. And I can tell you, I can tell you, and you can quote me on this 10 years later, that the, uh, the material is the thing that will make the difference. And this will not be 
uh, uh, obvious, will not be clear now. It will take at least eight to ten years to uh, to be uh, known. Exactly like the uh, the angle supported lenses, when uh, when Alcon introduced the Acrisoft cachet. No offense here, but from day one I told them this lens will not will not go anywhere. Uh, they're putting all th all their efforts. Alcon is a gigantic company, but I told them that this will not will not survive and now they, they withdraw it from the market why, why? why for, for for many reasons because actually soft cache is an angle supported lens uh, very sensitive to the sizing so it rotates in the anterior chamber 15 percent of the lenses of the cache rotates in the anterior chamber so it cannot correct uh, astigmatism that's one reason the material of the lens being close to the endothelium induces endothelial decompensation. Not for the first five years. Because we had this experience before with the, with the Novita lens, with the angle-supported lens. The, the reports on endothelial cell count in peer-reviewed journals were excellent for the first five, maybe 10 years. And then after the 10 years, it, it drops down. Uh, and plus, it cannot correct more than 12 diopters. So you're very close to the range where many people are doing LASIK. 8, 9, 10. So you need a, a lens that corrects more than uh, 12, 12 drops are not enough with no astigmatism. Then the, the patients, the, the good patients for the Acrisoft cachet were very uh, small pool of, of small population of the big pool. The material, the acrylic, is not really uh, friendly in the anterior chamber. They have lots of endothelial decompensations uh, uh, after f five, eight years from the insert. Now, for the ICL, what are the keys to success? If you want to have a successful ICL practice, to the best of my knowledge, these are the five factors that can lead to a successful uh, ICL uh, surgery. A proper patient selection, an ICL, a proper ICL uh, uh, power and sizing, a proper surgical technique, a proper post-operative management, and a proper management of complications. So if you know the details, if you know how to do each of these uh, five uh, steps, then you will, be, you will have a wonderful and successful experience with the ICL. And remember, the ICL is a very simple, it's like LASIK, it's very easy, it's two steps, but if anything goes wrong, it's difficult to correct. With the FACO surgery, I'm sure most of you are FACO surgeons, you can do mistakes, you can correct them. You can even have a vitreous loss, drop nucleus, but you can correct them and the patient can uh, have an excellent vision later on. But with the ICL, like with the LASIK and the refractive surgery in general, simple surgery, very little steps, but very narrow room of forgiveness. So you need to be really sure of what you're doing. So now let's start with the patient selection. I'm sure we all agree that between uh, the age of 20, 21, when the, stabili the reflection stabilizes, up to 38, 40, this is, does anybody disagree that these are a good age for any refractive surgery between 20, 18, 20? We can debate 18, 20, 38, or 40, but this is no problem. The problem is, the question is, kids, children. So uh, do you do ICL in children? Do you do ICL in, in uh, elderly patients above 40? These are the two points. Uh, for children, you know, I did a review of literature and there are many, many publications. Conclusion is, fakic IL in general are good, are appropriate in children in certain conditions. Of course, severe anisometropia, uh, you cannot, uh, they cannot wear glasses, you're, fear of, uh, you're, you're afraid of amblyopia. In some uh, young uh, kids with um, uh, neurobehavioral disorder that do not wear glasses, they are in danger, might inden endanger themselves. Uh, you try glasses, you try contact lenses, you can not go anywhere with the... So instead of getting the, 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 the kid with amblyopia in a few years, then we can go and do effective lenses. To me today, uh, I don't know what is the younger age you did for ICL, Ola? Nine? F five years. Five years. That, that, that's very reasonable, yeah. Five years. I did similar ages, five, six maybe. Uh, uh, and I actually put ICL on, on 
the, 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 the son of one of my very close friends. He was seven years old. He was, he had a myopia, he, he, and he's an eye surgeon. And he was refusing the idea, and then after a few years, he, we did it. At that time, he was seven years old, and we did the surgery on his eye. So the acceptance of ICR in children is getting more and more. I would do, on my uh, son or daughter, I would do an ICL if he or she has a high anisometropia rather than doing a LASIK at the age of eight, six, or, or nine, for, for many reasons. Now let's go to the elderly patient. I always thought that I wouldn't do a fake glance of someone who is 38, 90, uh, 38, uh, 39, 30, because of the higher incidence of cataract, which is true. When we started doing fake glances in the early 90s, we thought that the elderly patients are the best patients because they are going to develop cataract anyway. So if you're going to do cataract, uh, they will develop cataract in 10 years. And then with the experience, we learned that the younger lenses are more robust. They, they, they can withhold the trauma of the surgery much more than the elder uh, 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 lenses. Uh, so the incidence of cataract in elder patients are, is higher, of course. But if you compare this with clear lens extraction, uh, definitely, I would say, ICL is safer. If you compare this with LASIK for a 38 years old with a, with, with a wonderful normal cornea for a minus 8, I would do an ICL. Because I know that a few years later, maybe 10, 15 years later, you're going to remove the ICL and do FACO on this patient when he's 55 or 60, and then you, ha you will have no problem with IOL calculation, you will have no problem with the quality of vision, and you will have a very successful FACO surgery. You, can, you might use a multifocal at that time, but if you have a LASIK uh, or PRK mm -hmm. on a cornea that's already multifocal, you cannot use any of the, maybe the newer generation uh, multifocal, which will hopefully be better than what we are we're having today. So uh, uh, with the new hole, with the aqua port, the V4C, which is available now in the Middle East for a couple of years, uh, the risk of cataract is less much less because of the physiological circulation of the aqueous around the, the lens. So now, nowadays, I am uh, 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 more in doing, in putting ICLs in elderly patients. You know, in, sometimes I tell my patients, you have uh, very early nuclear sclerosis, you're 42, but you're enjoying the intermediate vision. You have 20-20 vision with correct, you're minus eight. Then we put an ICL, and then I know that 15 years from now, when you're 55 or 60 years old, you're going to remove this and put a lens, a, 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 do a fake on your eye. Uh, the type and amount of error, the ICL range is from 19, minus 19 to plus 10, can correct astigmatism up to six doctors. They can actually correct anything, but it, it, it has to do with the manufacturing of the lens. They won't tell you that we are correcting astigmatism of seven or nine. They can correct up to nine or even more, but it takes them too much effort in, you know, a change in the routine manufacturing. But if you ask them for a special request for lens that corrects astigmatism up to nine, they will, they can do it. Now, let's look at this few examples. This is a patient with high myopia. Um, uh, you see the, his minus nine with minus two cylinder before the surgery. Look at his MTF. I'm not sure if you're all aware of the MTF, but this is the measure of, this is modulation transfer function. This is the measure of the quality of vision. This is very similar to the contrast sensitivity, but this is objective and much easier to get. So this is the MTF. The higher it is, the, best, the better the visual quality is, and what we look at is the area under the curve. So this is before the surgery. Look, after the surgery, the MTF did not change because the patient uh, had a, the same quality of vision. In such a patient, actually this is another patient, I'm sorry, this is the same patient, this is the, the high myopic patient, minus nine, minus two, you look at the high uh, MTF and you expect the same after the surgery. This is another patient, another eye, look at this with this sus very suspicious cornea, with the opposite sector index is uh, more than two. So this is a suspicious cornea. We might debate on this, but I wouldn't do LASIK or PRK or any kind of corneal refractive surgeon on this patient, especially he has an excellent quality of vision. So an ICL is the best uh, option for this patient who is minus three. 
Uh, another case with a thin cornea, this is 474. If this patient is minus 5 or minus 6 or even less, I wouldn't do LASIK or PRK on him. I would go easily with the, with the deep anterior chamber. Uh, I don't know what is anterior. Yeah, 3.2. Then this is a good case for ICR. Now, this patient is minus 11 uh, with such a flat cornea. Imagine even if, even if you decide to do a corneal refractive surgery on this patient, how would be the case after the surgery, starting with 40, correcting 12, so it will be, it will end in like 30. This will be a terrible quality of vision. He will have 60, 20, 20 vision or 6 over 6, but he will have a terrible quality of vision. If you put, just put an ICL in this eye, the second day he will be very happy. Now, what else should we look uh, uh, other than the age and the error? Uh, we, we should look at the anterior chamber depth. And the credit goes to the company, to Star Company, because when we started doing, is anybody doing anterior chamber fecic lenses here sometimes? Because this is, this is a little bit sad to say, but this is what happened. 20 years ago, the companies who are manufacturing the anterior chamber, uh, uh, anterior chamber fecic lenses, they were using three, millim three millimeter at the minimum for the anterior chamber depth. But they were measuring the anterior chamber depth from the epithelium. And this is how we did all our uh, artisan cases many years ago. Until now, the company of tech, they did not change their recommendation. And I had a meeting with them in, in Las Vegas a few, few months ago. And I told them, please do change it. Because I went to the website. I looked at it. It did not say that it's from the endothelium. I told them, I have patients who were 3 millimeter from the epithelium 20 years ago uh, with a corneal thickness of, let's say, 500. So the anterior chamber from the endothelium is 2.5. This is too shallow. And this patient developed endothelial cell loss down the road. I hope they will change it. They, they were not very happy of my comment, but this is what it is. Because the ACD, anterior chamber, by definition, is from the epithelium. So when you say anterior chamber depth, that means from the epithelium. So you have to be very careful that the anterior chamber depth you're talking about is from the endothelium. Endothelial cell count is important. Uh, uh, iris configuration is also needed to be flat or concave, which is 99%. But sometimes you have patients with a convex iris. These are not good for any FICAC lenses. So make sure if you're using a Pentacam or an orb scan, uh, make sure to adjust your anterior chamber depth from the endothelium. They call it internal anterior chamber depth. That's very, very important. Uh, if you are using IOL master, that has to be from the epithelium. So you have to subtract the corneal thickness from your measurement. So be very careful about it. I learned it the hard way. This is one of my own cases who had an artisan 20 years ago, anterior chamber depth more than 3 millimeter from the epithelium, corneal thickness 550. So the internal anterior chamber depth is 2.4. If you put an lens in the anterior chamber, the, and they will have an excellent endothelium up to 10 years, and then it will drop down the drain. So this is a message for whoever is doing uh, anterior chamber lenses, make sure that you're not, you're not following the company recommendation of three millimeters from the epithelium. What's the, what's the minimum that you can get? Three millimeter from the endothelium. F and, and the ICL is even further away from the endothelium. You can be a little bit yeah, more relaxed with the ICL than with an artisan or with an angle fixed lens because it's closer. So, but for an artisan, or an angle supported lens, I would never go less than three millimeter from the endothelium. This is the old. This is the old recommendation. Two. Uh, I would say two point eight for an ICL that is not thick, up to minus uh, six or seven diopters. Not not high astigmatism, so it's not a thick lens. The the shoulder of the lens is not thick. 2.8 is okay. But for a hyperopic lens, a high astigmatic lens, 3 millimeter is better. You can use uh, an ICL for convex iris, even with convex iris. Or well, you can. You can put it. 
there is no no one will will prevent you from putting it but later on this patient will develop angle closure easy much easier if you have if you're a little bit uh, off the 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 size the, the the length of the lens then you might easily develop angle closure please For pseudophakia, this is a, yeah, this is a great indication, but very expensive, but an excellent indication. I, I'm always doing this. And the design is same as usual, I mean. And you, you're not, you have no problem. You just put it because it's it's you have a pseudophakia already, uh, but the and even you can use a toric lens. This is this is the growing indication in my in my practice. I stopped doing any ICI OL exchange for wrong IOL calculations, uh, even if it's hyperopic. Then usually you have a deep anterior chamber. So th this is a great indication. Ah. It's off-label, but it is. When the patient go without cataract, hmm? regarding IOL calculation. Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. OK. What type of lens you choose <coughs> in the IOL calculation? Suppose I don't have IOL master, I have A-scan biometric. So. You saw it's known here. And you saw it's known. I don't know how to do IOL calculation. It's very, very simple. It's not a thick one. Is it a thick one? A thick one. Ah, no need to change the type of one. Very, very thick. لو ما كنتش جيت كنت هديني نمرد تليفونك. Okay, now uh, when you are counseling your patients for ICL surgery, you need to talk about the quality of vision. What I usually do, I do not promise them better vision than glasses. I do not promise them better quality of vision than glasses. But I know that especially the higher myopes will have a better vision. So I tell them, this is what you're seeing with your glasses, 2030, 2050, or 2020. This is the maximum you're going to see. I'm sorry, I'm going to see you on the right side. I'm going to see you on the right side. I'm going to see you on You tell the patient that you're not going to see better, but you're going to see like you see, actually, I tell them one line plus or one line minus. This is what I'm telling them. But I know that with high myopic, you see better. Yes, the first few weeks, the patient experienced some glare. Uh, many of them do. This is because of the change in the aberrations. But in few weeks, maximum few months, they just forget it. They, they, they get it's, it's a neuro adaptation. It takes some time. Uh, this is an example of a patient with high cylinder, I think, relatively high cylinder. This is minus 5, minus 3. And you see the MTF is very high. Uh, uh, with the toric ICL in the eye, then you have the same MTF. So the quality of vision did not change. If you look at all the indices of the cornea, they are the same. They don't change. I would, you can do LASIK on this patient, but you have to talk about enhancement rate, high astigmatism. Uh, possibility of, of do, you see the, the, the outcome is almost plano, if not plano. Here. So the refractive <coughs> predictability with the fake lenses in general, not only the ICL, is extremely high, much higher than eczema laser or, or, or smile now or any kind of cornea refractive surgery because it does not uh, depend on the individual response of the patient. Now, uh, we went through some of this. You tell the patient that it maintains the quality of vision and the, and the visual equity, but it does not improve it. Usually it does. In many cases it does. But you don't tell this to your patients before the surgery. You give him some surprise, some bonus after the surgery. You need to explain to them that this is an intraocular procedure. Uh, uh, and for, with high myopes, even younger patients, high myopes or elderly patients, I go through the discussion with the cataract, what they would expect in the next 20 years. Um, recovery time is fast. post ortho precautions, I'm sure you're all aware of this. You must go with your patients about this. Special indications, post grafts, this is a growing. Please. Well, the, per the, the, in, my, in my hands, now over 10 years, and I can tell you the exact percentage of cataract in my hand is less than 0.02%. I do, uh, in, in 1,000, you have four eyes. So that's 0.04%. So it's, it's a very low percentage. And these are the high myopes uh, and the relatively older age. My first cataract, when I had my first cataract after the ICL, it was a nightmare. Which I know why. Of course, I went to Umrah and I went to work 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 and I was really happy. 
I'm surprised that the patient first day after the fake or removed ICL did the fake or she was extremely happy. Fa, fa, fa. No, I didn't see, I didn't have a single case of Umrina Shuf Naharit Glucoma about ICL. No, we didn't. I, I, I'm not talking about immediate high pressure because of the basin retained viscoelastic or because of the wrong sizing. Fa, not the immediate black end. I'm, I'm talking about late, yani late developed glaucoma because of ICL. I didn't say that. Iridectomy, of course, yeah. With the V4, if you don't do iridectomy, you'll have pupillary block on day one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so post graft is a growing indication in our practice, especially with post uh, lamellar graft, because you have a good. لما لما كده قول لي يعني عشان أنا بسرح. وأنتوا ما عنيم بتقولوش حاجة. ما تيجوا كده طيب. لازم مش عارف أنا أروح فين ها أفور الشاشة كده. فا ال. ما أقدرش أثبت مشكلتي في حياتي دي ما أقدرش أثبت. So the post graft are especially the endothelial the 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 lamellar grafts with uh, good endothelial cell count, so they are very good cases. Actually, part of my counseling, my patients, keratoconus who are for DALC, you're going to do the graft, you're going to remove the sutures after one year. If the astigmatism is high, we'll do uh, astigmatic keratotomy. And then you need either go on your glasses, or if the error is high, you can do an eye So it's part of the counseling. The patient know about it from day one. Post cross-linking is really uh, a great indication for this young uh, kids who have keratoconus cross-linking they see 2020 and then one year or two years later you do an icl this is an excellent uh, 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 refractive rehabilitation for them i'm not a big fan i'm not a fan of the doing the cross-linking with pr how many of you are doing cross-linking and prk in these patients uh, uh, keratoconus young 20 21 years old with 2020 vision with the glasses and minus two sphere minus one cylinder but keratoconus same 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 setting zero percent thank you uh, uh, post intracorneal ring segments when it works uh, your patient is happy then you can put an icl stable keratoconus again remember that Keratoconus can go in any direction, can be stable from the beginning, can be stable for a while, then periods of exacerbations. So if it, if you have it, we have a young girl in the hospital, she has keratoconus for more than 25 <coughs> years. And we diagnosed her when she was 20 something. So we have, we have a, 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 an, an incredible record of her topographies, and she is uh, stable for more than 15 years now. But the problem is her anterior chamber is, is shallow. It has no room. Yeah. Yeah. This is a. Yeah. 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 with residual error that we're going to This is a growing indication. It's an excellent indication for these patients. A uh, little bit expensive. Like, an, if, to me, it's much better than doing an IOL exchange, uh, of course. Yeah. You just mentioned that uh, it can be used for corners after post thinking. How do you calculate the power? Exactly the same way. But sometimes it's different. I mean, or in, in, other, in another way, what are your criteria to select the patient having post thinking to ICL? Okay. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Tomorrow, Saturday, I have a talk on ICL in, in stable keratoconus, and this exactly addresses this point. It's, it's a critical point. Okay, let's spend a couple of minutes here. Uh, the vision, correct, the distant corrected visual equity has to be acceptable to the patient. With that, the that's with, with the the, this, No, no, with the glasses. With the, glasses. the glasses, with glasses, not with contact lenses, with glasses. The corrected distant vision has to be acceptable to the patients. Okay, that's one. Two, it has to be acceptable to you. And if the patient tells me I'm happy with 2100, no, I'm not happy with 2100. But if he tells me I'm happy with 2030, that's fine. Uh, he has to use the same glasses 
for at least three months. Because you might uh, do the manifest reflection of this patient. If, if, if it's the, the first time to see the patient, he comes, you do the reflection, he sees 20-20 with the correction. You don't go and do an ICF. You give him the, this pair of glasses, tell him go for three months and come back. If you tell me you're happy with this correction, then I can proceed. Because the keratoconus patients are very tricky. They, they, they look from different points on different days. And reaching the end point of the, manif of the retinoscopy is very difficult. So don't trust one refraction. The patient has to be happy with his glasses for at least three months. On the other hand, if the patient comes to you, tell you I am using these glasses for five years, it's, it's minus uh, four, minus two, and I'm extremely happy with these glasses, and I he can see 2020, then you can proceed. So the patient is the main deciding factor. The chair time for these patients is very long. It's not like a, a regular ICL patients who just sit for five minutes and then go to the counseling. Do you do the test of wearing contact lens eyes to show the patient this is the vision that you will see after surgery? No, it's because, so because of course, not hard contact lenses. Soft. soft contact lenses, they might give him even a better vision than the ICF. So I don't do this. I give him the, eye, the, the glasses because if he's happy with the glasses, then he will be at definitely happy with the ICF. But if he's happy with the contact lens, I'm not sure if he'll be the same. So, so here you keep, remember this is an off-label indication. So you don't want to be aggressive. You, ha you have to do it only when you're sure that your patient will be happy. So maybe if, you know, if, if this is an approved indication, then you can go this step for, uh, further. But for now, this is an off-label indication. You don't want your patient to be unhappy in any way. Uh, now, the sizing of the ICL, if I would say there is one thing that is unfinished business in this ICL surgery, it is the, the sizing. Uh, there are a lot of things to discuss about sizing. This needs 90 minutes on, on its own. But conclusion, white to white is good enough in 95% of the cases. I tried to many other uh, things, but back to the white to white. White to white is good enough. Whether you do this with the calipers, whether you do this with the pentacam, with an orb scan, with the Galilee, with whatever, but the white white is good enough. If your instrument is properly calibrated, especially the calipers, if you go to your OR and you get 10 calipers that are used for strabismus surgery, you put them on the scale, and I did this experience 10 years ago, you will find that they are not well calibrated. So, and this is the most common reason for uh, uh, wrong calculations is uncalibrated calipers. Uh, Pentacam, uh, uh, sorry? White to white. The horizontal white to white. The horizontal diameter of the cornea. Okay? Uh, UBM, we got the UBM many years ago, high frequency ultrasound. We thought that this will increase the accuracy. It's very cumbersome. Uh, not reproducible. It only helps on those very rare cases where you have iris or sulcus abnormality, like iris cyst, something uh, very rare. It gave us any clue on what it did not improve our, our uh, sizing. Uh, and for the patients, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. They tell you after the surgery, everything is, is good except for this test that I did. Uh, Anterior chamber depth is a very important parameter, and a few weeks ago I've seen a patient who had wrong sizing because of the wrong anterior chamber depth entered, because the, 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 the surgeon used an IOL master, so he took the anterior chamber depth from the epithelium and he did not realize it. Please. And look at Okay, we're going to get into this in a few minutes. Uh, if I, if I, if I just, just remember, if I don't mention it, because we're going to go into this. The, um, the uh, anterior chamber depth is critical. It, in keratoconus patients, then it's deeper, so it, will be, it, it might change the power calculation. Now, calipers is the most commonly used. Uh, I, till now, after all these years, we're still doing the calipers. We're doing the pentacam and comparing with the calipers. If we have really different, uh, big difference between both, we go back and recheck. And if you have difference between both eyes, then you need to go back and check again. 
it, it is wise, uh, I'm not doing this anymore, but I did it for so many years. It's wise to double check your measurements under the microscope during the surgery. It's, it's more patient, the eye is widely open, more relaxed situation, you can measure better your white white. You didn't find this match. Hmm? Well, this is, this is for double checking, but before you open the eye, if you, if you, if you measured it, uh, um, uh, 11 in the clinic on the slit lamp, and then you find it 12.5, then you even, you better cancel the case. Just for a double, double checking. Um, now, the, with the Pentacam, I use the Pentacam to, I do Pentacam for all my patients with, with the OPD scan. I do the pentacam to all my patients. I want to know from the first minute before even talking to the patient that I is he a good candidate for ICL or no? Even if he is a low myope, I want to know this. Do I have the option of ICL or no? So you get the anterior chamber depth from the uh, pentacam internal, and you get the uh, uh, white to white, the corneal diameter or white to white diameter from the pentacam. If you have the add-on camera now, all the Pentacams have it, but that was a new hardware at a at, at certain point, maybe two years ago. Um, Orbis can is doing the same thing. This is, I think this is, I put this because it's an old case. Uh, if you can find the date, I'm sure it's very old. I don't know what is the date. Yeah. 15? Yeah. 2002, huh? I don't yeah, here in the place. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, 2002. Yeah, yeah. So at this time, the our orb scan was calibrated from the epithelium, anterior chamber depth from the epithelium. So make sure that your pentacam or your orb scan or your Galilee or your whatever ha is measuring from the endothelium, because this might create big problems. Another thing for the sizing, which is very important, is the limbal pigmentation. The only thing I note. I put a note in the file when seeing the patient on the slit lamp uh, about the sizing, if the patient has a, pig, a, a limbal pigmentation, because this will overestimate the white white. This is one reason for the pentacam or the orb scan or whatever to measure this uh, more than uh, it, it actually is. So be aware of the limbal pigmentation. Now, IOL master, uh, uh, I always do IOL master for my patients because I want to know the axial length. If the patient comes five years later with myopia, then we want to know if this is progressive or uh, progressive myopia or this is anything else, or nuclear sclerosis, for example. Uh, and correlate, correlate your measurements always with the calipers. Uh, and Intraoperative uh, measurement is always important. Anterior segment OCT, it does not help much in the sizing, though in some cases, the angle to angle can tell you something. There are some surgeons using angle to angle, but I didn't do this. The, the good thing about the anterior segment OCT is to show you the lens rise. In some cases, the crystalline lens is, rise is too high. Then you take this in consideration uh, because of the vaulting. Uh, this is one of the uh, high frequency ultrasound, um, the uh, Quantel, the, the, the compact touch that we used many years ago. Uh, it's a very nice machine, but it's not yet ready to use in high volume practice on regular, you know, it's good for, for uh, uh, studies, but it, it's not really uh, helpful in, um, the, uh, in, in, in the clinical setup. Now, when you know the anterior chamber depth, you know the white to white, you know the, the, the uh, refraction, you go to the calculation, uh, the online calculator. Here is a tip that I'm, I'm going to give you, and I think it's very important. For example, this patient, this is just a, a, a test patient, uh, whatever, minus uh, 7, minus 1.5, blah, 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 blah. Now, the anterior chamber depth is 3.1, the white to white is 12. This is your point here. If I measured the white to white 12, then I go on the online calculator and with these measurements, the uh, lens suggested is 13.2. Okay? So what do I do? I go with the, on, while on the calculator, I go and I change this one step, 12.1, and see the same size. 12.2, same size. 
12.3, same size. 12.4, now it went, it went to the higher size, okay? Then you go the other direction. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm going in the other direction. 11 point, it, we started with 12, you go to 11.8, 11.7, and so on. 11.7, it's the same uh, uh, size. 11.6, it went to the 12.6, which is the smaller size. So now my patient is 12. Between 11.7 and 12.3, it will be the same size. So I'm very safe. I'm very safe. Now, what if the patient is on the border? If you change the diameter, and the same applies to the anterior chamber depth. If you change by one step, one millimeter, 0.1 millimeter, and then the lens jumps to the next diameter. Now, remember the ICL has four sizes. I like to call it small, medium, large, extra large, okay? 90% of, maybe more, of my patients are in the middle two sizes, between medium and large. Very little, very few patients are on the extremes. If, if I have a patient on the extreme, this is an alarming sign. I tell my technician, if you have any patient who is extra large or small, you have to tell, we have to repeat everything again to make sure that the patient is, everything is correct. Now, if everything is correct, I go with this patient and see at what uh, uh, change, how much do I need to change the white to white or the anterior chamber depths to go to the safer size. If it's only 0.1, I'll go to the extra large or the medium. So I always try to make my patients between the medium and the large sizes. I do not go to the smallest or the largest size unless I'm very sure that this patient really needs a large lens. Okay, I, ho I hope I'm clear. Now, let's go to the surgical technique and uh, anesthesia with the, I prefer topical. It's topical, and believe me, it's easier than general or uh, local anesthesia in this space. It's much easier because you need the patient cooperation. Uh, now, loading, 50% of the procedure is loading. If you load the ICL properly, then you're 50% you're uh, 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 on your way home. If you do not, then you're, you might be in trouble. Now, uh, I use this, the, this sponge tip. You can use a, a, a for, non tooth forceps for the same thing. The point is to load the lens symmetrically in the uh, uh, cartilage. Under the dovetail of the cartilage, it needs to be symmetrical. And then you pull it with this uh, front loading forceps. That was designed by a retina surgeon, of course. Sometimes they do good things. <laughs> and, then you, and then you pull the cartridge or you pull the lens, and you make sure you visualize the landmarks of the lens, the hole, the three holes that they are on the vertical axis of the cartridge. If you're done, if you did it this way, then you're 50% done. If you're not, if, you, if the lens is, to, if the ICL is twisted inside the cartridge, very simple, just push it out and reload it again. I'm doing this even in live surgery. If you do live surgery, you know, you're, you're the, 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 the expert and you want to show everything perfect. And then, and it happened to me in India when I had the lens twisted inside the cartridge. So I was between two decisions and you have to take it in a fraction of a second, you need to decide whether to act as the excellent surgeon who can do anything, anytime, and then put it, and then it might go upside down, or to stop and inject it and reload it. And I thought, I, what I did, I told them, I, do, I did this intentionally to show you how the loading can be <laughs> bad. So I'm now I'm going to take it out and then reload it again. And it takes less than a minute. Now, the injection of the lens. You, you want to be a fast surgeon, Okay, good for you. But the only thing that you need to be slow is the injection of the lens. Now notice the wound and the cartridge in the wound. Now what I'm doing here is a wound-assisted injection. Okay, a wound-assisted, you're doing this with your FACO. If you're go, the, the, the diameter of this, cali, of this cartridge is three millimeter. If your wound, if your wound, wound is more than three millimeter, three point anything, then you can put the cartridge in the wound and inject safely, you have no problem. But if you decide to go less than three millimeter, then you have to do a wound assisted injection, which means the cartridge is not 
fully inside the wound, but only the tip of the cartilage. And you're using the wound to have to, to create a, a tunnel where the lens goes on. In this case, you need to keep your pre the pressure on the eye. Don't release. Because if you release, the lens will slip. And I'll show you this in a second. Now, injection is most important to be slowly, slow. And then you, uh, you uh, watch the, uh, sorry, you watch the um, distal haptics. Look, here I'm injecting, I'm looking at the wound. I do not want to lose this. And I'm looking at the distal uh, haptics. I'm waiting for them to unfold properly. Once you see they are unfolding, once they unfold in a way that they cannot be upside down, I inject the rest of them. And then you can do the rest as fast as you want. Now, the lens is in the anterior chamber. With this manipulator, this is designed by Juan Baye from the Dominican Republic, again, a retinal surgeon. Uh, uh, he's a great man, actually. Now, you put this in the, uh, under the iris from the main wound. Then you put more viscoelastic. And I like here, yeah, this is, you know, a surgeon preference. I like to put more viscoelastic on top of the lens so you can push the lens backward then you, the, the, the visco will go from behind the lens to the uh, anti, uh, in front of the lens. And I, I prefer to do the paracentesis at this stage. You can do this at the beginning. Again, it's totally a surgeon preference. Uh, my tip here is to do the paracentesis in the same direction of your spatula. Many surgeons will do it straight like this. Then you go with the spatula, you have to change the direction. Then the cornea will become uh, 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 wrinkled. Then this will decrease the visualization. Please. Always, 100% of the time. <laughs> yes. We, we touch the anterior tip of the fist line. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Two stages. Always. Just insertion, the haptics under the iris, we touch. And unfolding the lens, also uh, we touch the... You are touching the crystalline lens 100% of the time. Wh whether you know it, you see it, or you don't see it. And I did this on a series of cases. I did a huge magnification. And I looked at 20 cases that I did, and I thought I didn't touch them. No, you're touching the lens. The, the, the lens is touching the, the ICL. It's touching the lens 100% of the time. But this does not induce cataract. If this induces cataract, you should have 100% cataract. On? Yes. Yes, yes, in the, yes, there is always a space, there is a vault. Yes, the, the, the ICL is convex, so there is a vault, there is a space between the back surface of the ICL and the anterior surface of the crystalline lens. This space can be anything between 200 and 1,000 microns. The ideal would be 450 or 500 microns. But there is always a space. If there is no space, then you are in trouble. You have to keep your eye on the patient. This patient might develop cataract. OK. Now this will the, the remove the. Uh, now aligning of the toric lens is important. You will mm. always go and take the visco visco 100. No, no, no. 100% I, 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 of the time, I take it out. Because I've seen, I know some surgeons are doing this. Uh, they are washing it with the, with the white bore cannula, the French way. And, and, but I've seen many cases, uh, but not many, but at least in this last 10 years, at least five or seven cases, five to seven cases, who came with a very high pressure after the, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't see them on the first day, but I saw them a few months later. And they tell me that we had this uh, surgery, and uh, then the next day we had a very high pressure, and then the pupil is fixed dilated. And you, there are very few things you can do for these patients. So aligning of the lens is important. Uh, marks before the lens on the horizontal meridian. You, there are many ways to do this, like you're doing with your toric lenses for the FACO. There are many ways. None is really perfect. But I, the best way I do this, I do it on the, in the, in the preoperative room, horizontal marking with, uh, with, um, with the pen marker on horizontal. And I always like to put 
one mark at 90, degree, at 90 degrees, so it's as a reference. Uh, nowadays, we are using this Z alignment from the, um, from the uh, uh, Zeiss. Uh, it, it, help, it, it, it helps a lot, but you have to have good marks. Now, with the new software they have with the IOL 700, I think, uh, IOL, uh, IOL Master 700, this one, then you can, uh, this can be transferred to your microscope without marking, which will be a big step forward, inshallah. Next week we'll have this. Hopefully uh, it works. Uh, it, it will rotate only if it is small. If the lens is undersized, then it will rotate. Yeah, yeah, I've seen, I've seen, I had, I had at least four or five patients that I remember in the last 10 years, at least four or five patients who had small size ICL and they rotated, they're perfect day one, then they disappear, they come back uh, after one month with a very bad vision after having a very good vision for the, for the first day. Then you, yeah, it's rotated. Well, if there is no history of trauma and, uh, and you think you don't think that the patient really had something to hit his eye, which was in most of the cases, then you know that the lens is small. So you, you order another lens, a larger lens, one step larger, and then you exchange it. Uh, Tori Cam, I like this because I like Graham Barrett. Graham Barrett designed this. This is an application on your iPhone. You can, you can download it, and you can use it, and it helps a lot in verifying your marks because you can do the... Uh, the marks on the, while the patient is, is uh, on in the preoperative or on the slit lamp, and your marks might not be horizontal. So with this application, you can know whether your, your uh, marks are correct or not. So it will tell you if your horizontal marks are really horizontal, or if there is a deviation, it, it will tell you how much deviation it is. So you know this uh, during search. Uh, now this is a case where I want you to show something which is very important, but I don't really remember what was it. Yeah, this is the wound where you're going to lose your wound assistance. Look at, look at the cartilage. Injecting, everything is going fine. And then you lost, you lost the, 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 the cartilage slipped from the wound. So it's not wound assisted anymore. Then you have no control on the lens. The lens can go anywhere. So do, do not be in this position. How not to be in this position? You either use a large incision, 3.2, which again, what I do 100% of the time in live surgery, 3.2, and then you inject easily. Uh, uh, if you go smaller incision, like now I'm doing, my routine is 2.8. So you, it has to have a, uh, uh, you have to do wound assisted, otherwise you have no control on the lens and then it might go anywhere. In this case, it goes upside down. Another case uh, with wound, again, poor uh, wound assisted injection, you see. Now, oh, once you lose this, you have no control on the lens. You can go with helon? Uh, yeah, you can. You can put helon around and push it inside, but this will, be, this will be difficult. So the best thing is not to be into this position. One, now, once the lens is inside the eye and the, 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 the distal haptic did not fold enough, then what I do, I go with this manipulator and unfold, help the trailing haptics to unfold. Once you have the trailing haptic unfold, there is no point, there is no way for the lens to go upside down. Okay? Again, this is the same thing, so let's skip this video. Uh, now, post-operatively, uh, you always check the IOP after two hours because give the, give the uh, uh, pressure time to rise. If it's going to build up, then you need at least two hours to check the pressure. If the pressure is high, it's very easy to burp the, the wound or the paracentesis. Uh, and you have to follow on your pressure for the first early days. I noticed that your wound is eliminated. Why did you use the cornea? Uh, my wound is, you know, at the end of the cornea. I like to see this little bit bleeding here. So this, 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 this helps healing, uh, uh, wound healing, wound sealing is better. 
I, I like to go, you know, to the very far of the cornea, almost limber. So if, um, I actually like to see this little bit of bleeding. I feel better because the, 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 this means that the wound is vascularized. It will heal. It will heal. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I try to think of the most common causes of problem that I saw, whether with my cases or from other surgeons during training or from my colleagues. The most common cause for a wrong power was the wrong data entry, especially with the, with the cylinder, especially with the sign of the cylinder. One of the disadvantage of the online calculator, it can accept plus or minus cylinder. So if you, if you want to enter minus 3, minus 2, access 180, then by mistake you enter minus 3, 2, it will accept it. Then you will have a wrong. This is the most common cause of data entry, of, of the wrong uh, power. Anterior chamber depth from the epithelium. I've seen this a couple of times, one with the IOL master and one with the pentacam, when, where the surgeon did not adjust his. Uh, 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 uncalibrated calipers, you'll be surprised. But this is the most <laughs> common cause I saw over years from different surgeons, uh, uh, uncalibrated calipers. Limbal pigmentation, I've, I've, I have one case. I learned it the hard way. So from that day, I always uh, look at the limbal pigment. Uh, the most common causes of surgical difficulties is poor loading, uh, di poorly dilated pupil. Do not start unless the pupil is dilated, well di decently dilated. Because it, 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 if you trust it, and if, if it works with you with your phacos, then do it. But do not start your uh, your loading the uh, injecting the ICL unless you have a nicely dilated pupil. Small incision with poor assisted wound. You need to understand the, the, the mechanics of wound-assisted injection. Otherwise, you can go to a 3.2 millimeter incision and you will be very safe. Uh, I've seen surgeons using the discovisc or the viscoat. These are contraindicated with the ICL because these are uh, dispersive viscoelastics and you do not want to do this. Discovisc and viscoat are not used with an ICL. Uh, inadequate wash of the viscoelastic, you go in with either with your bimanual irrigation aspiration or with whatever irrigation aspiration you do, and you remove it. Uh, I've seen cases of cataract. Excessive manipulation is one reason, one cause. Uh, peripheral ICL touch, I would say this is the most important cause of cataract, most common cause of cataract I've seen. This is one that is a shallow vault. 100 micron, but at the periphery, the, the ICL is touching the crystalline lens. And you can see this if you dilate the pupil and you do a, a Visanti, for example, you see touching the lens. So there is a sequestered aqueous that do not wash. So metabolites accumulate, and this is a, a, a cataract that develops in anterior subcapsular cataract. This is the most common cause I've seen with ICL. So even if there is a, a little volt. The good news with the, with the V4C, I didn't see yet any case with zero volt because the aqueous always circulates, so the, there is always a space between the lens and the ICL. A misalignment, I've seen many of these. A most common cause is not rotation, but it's wrong alignment from the beginning. And this happened to me when the people get smaller during the surgery, at the end of the surgery, so you cannot see the marks, poor dilatation. So in this case, stop, dilate the pupil, and make sure you have the right alignments. Late rotation might occur only if the lens is undersized. So if the lens is undersized, it might rotate. In this case, uh, exchange for a larger lens is indicated. And you will know this if you, if you have a rotated lens and you decide to reposition it. If repositioning is very easy, just go like, this, then you know that this lens is small. So this lens will be exchanged. Uh, night glare, the most common cause I've saw with the, in the old days with the large aridectomies. Uh, uh, nowadays with large pupil with a very high myopia because the effective optical zone is smaller. If you go higher than this patient, you should be aware of this. Now, in many cases, you're going to need to change the ICL for uh, wrong power, for wrong uh, size for developed cataract later on. So what is the best way to remove the ICL? Uh, 
I'll, t I'll tell you one tip. It's only one thing. The wound has to be at least three millimeter. So if you do 2.8, you enlarge the wound. And then you put viscoelastic above and below if you can. Now, this is the tip. Deliver the ICL in the anterior chamber. <laughs> then rotate the lens. Okay, now this is my tip. Please, please focus on this. Now you put visco under and above the lens at this position, 45 degrees with the angle, with the, with the wound. And then you go with a toothed forceps and catch it from the shoulder, from the, the junction of the optic and the haptic. This is the thickest part of the lens, at least 700 microns. And then pull it. It will come out very easy. If you try to do what the company is recommended and use an untooled forceps, you, the lens will tear. So I did not have any lens that was torn uh, uh, using this technique. Uh, I'll show you. Without following the recommendation, why you jump to a true forceps? Because I know, because, you know, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. How I developed this, because I did this first with a patient who had an ICL and uh, cataract. I removed the lens, I'm not going to use it again, so I don't care. So I put it with, the, I hold it with a, um, a non-tooth. It was difficult to get out. So I got a tooth, can but easily. Then next patient, I had a patient uh, with an undersized lens. I'm going to remove it. I'm not going to put it again. So I have another lens for him. So again, non-tooth. It didn't really work well, but with the tooth, it worked very well. So from from that point, I always use uh, a tooth forces, but from you have to hold it from the. Uh, the right point. Otherwise, you will have uh, torn lenses. I noticed when you introduce your lens, you do a hypersymbol. What is this? Why don't you go up? Straight. Under the iris? Yeah. From the beginning, I thought that. It's a little bit difficult. It's not easy. It's a little bit difficult. It's a little bit difficult. Yeah. It's a little bit difficult. You have to. Yeah. You know, we. we we tried it with the, with the even the older lens. There was in, in the early '90s there was a lens from uh, Medinium that was a silicon lens, non-foldable, posterior chamber lens. Uh, it goes under the iris. It was very difficult to put it in the anterior chamber and then to, to tuck it because it's very rigid. It's, it's it's rigid lens. It's not foldable lens. We put we were putting this for a six millimeter incision to the ex and it was very difficult with the rigid lens to go under the uh, iris from the, from, the, from the beginning. To the extent that some surgeons developed a technique at that time, and we have another incision at 6 o'clock, and they pull the iris. It's too much, so I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't recommend. If it sometimes the lens just goes under the iris, sometimes. If it goes under the iris, that's fine. But I, I have no intention to put it under the iris. Now, what will happen in the future? I think the future will carry good news. We will confirm the advantage of the aqua port. Well, the aqua port was essentially, uh, there is a debate who designed it, but the idea was to uh, uh, have a, this central hole not to do an iridectomy. But I think the best advantage is not, not doing an iridectomy, but it is uh, to have a close to physiological aqueous circulation because the aqueous will flow from the center through the hole and then it goes in the regular more physiological than flowing through the uh, PI. And this will wash the metabolites around the lens and then it will be much better, yeah. Uh, presbyopic ICL, it's coming, it will come. I don't know if it's, I'm not very excited but I think it will come. And, uh, and uh, let's see how it will work. It, it's in the pipeline, maybe a year from now. Uh, what I'm really looking for, better sizing. I, I would, we have a good uh, uh, sizing technique so far, but it's not perfect. I would love to see my, all my ACL patients with the same volt, 450 or 500 for every patient. This, this is my ultimate goal 
which we, we did not reach so far. So to summarize, the uh, vi vision ICL is, I think it's essential for a safe refractive surgery. Uh, uh, phacic lenses are not competitor to laser surgery. Actually, they are complementing each other. They're not competing, they are complementing. Having your phacic lenses in your uh, in one of your choices, it makes your LASIK surgery safer because you don't have to push the limits. Uh, uh, the, 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 the safety index of the phacic lenses, especially the vision ICL, is very high. Patient satisfaction is really high. Uh, and the, 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 the only way I know to achieve excellent results is to have, uh, to look at the details, to pay attention to every single small step that you're doing. And in this case, you definitely have Excellent results. Thank you. Maybe in the future, I think the near future, No, we are not going to see preloaded ICL because it will the, the, the whole the whole concept was abundant. Yeah, for many reasons. One one of the reasons is that the company has to change their manufacturing firm from Switzerland to the United States. In the United States, they have to go through, again, a lot of approvals and stuff. So that they... Yeah, yeah, we, it, it will not, it will not... Well, it's nice to have it, but I don't think it's... They promised us. I know, I know, I know. And there were, actually, they had it already and loaded and ready to sell, but they, they, they stopped, the, the, to, to the best of my knowledge. But I don't think we're going to see it. But when you be like, that's better because, you know, imagine if you have preloaded lenses. Then now we know we loaded many lenses. Now we have the preloaded lenses, we use it. Now the next generation, they have only preloaded lenses. Now they have the lens upside down. What are they going to do? They need to load the lens again. So that I think, I think it's, it's, it's better for the procedure not to have preloaded lenses. Please. Well, there have been too many uh, 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 studies on accommodations. I don't think it does. I don't think it does. There are many, you know, many papers peer reviewed. You know, it's very difficult to measure accommodation. So that did in many ways, especially in, in, uh, in Vienna with uh, uh, Shmo Gunter. Uh, uh, they did all this uh, difficult test for accommodation. Conclusion is it doesn't affect accommodation. For with the V4C? Yes, uh, all of them. Uh. Because any, uh, any remaining of the viscoelastic in the acute chamber can be treated by tetrafacial, and if the pupil is dilated, this can cause urease the valley. It's occurred in one of my patients. If the intraocular pressure releases for two or three days, then the uh, viscoelastic clears from the acute chamber. So, the, so it can cause the, 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 the myocol will help the, vi yes. the, vis the viscoelastic to get? Uh, this is from my experience. Uh, I uh, hate air bubbles. Yeah. It doesn't go. This is one thing. Another thing, uh, strongly due to glaucoma, uh, it's common in these patients. And it can come because they are myopes. As early mm -hmm. as three days. Yeah. I occur in one, one of my patients. Uh, after three days of surgery, yeah. um, the IOB increased. And I thought this, this is because of the increased fault of the faulting of the uh, ICM. But uh, when I did the yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I agree on your second point. Steroid induced glaucoma might, it might occur. These people are myopes. You know myopes are more prone. So you have to keep your eye on this. It's not a big issue. But I totally disagree with your first point. You do not have to put myostat uh, or myocol after the surgery. Actually, I prefer to keep the pupil large because this will help the, the visco to come in the anterior chamber and to wash. You need to wash out the, the uh, thing. I, didn't, I don't think 
uh, all the urates of alias in Rome I've saw all the cases with myostat uh, uh, done with the, with the old V4B, so I'm sure they used some myostat. Uh, I'm doing the V4C for how many years now? Two years available since? Three years at least, th maybe three years. I didn't see, I do not put myostat in any uh, of these patients. And so I don't think myostat is, if you feel better putting the, my the myostat, that's fine. There is no harm. But the myostat, uh, uh, especially the myostat, uh, will make, will keep the uncorrected vision first day worse. When I started doing the V4C, uh, I was a little bit skeptical about the hole and the quality of vision and the aberrations and so on. So we did 45 patients with one eye V4B and one eye V4C. The only difference was in the uncorrected visual up in day one. The V4B had, a less, vis had less vision because of the, uh, of the myostat. Uh, it induces some myopia uh, in the first, first day or, or couple of days. But so I, 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 I'm not... I'm, I'm not sure that you that myo, putting myostat help, but it won't harm. I would I would put myostat only if the pupil is so large that I'm not really sure that the lens is under the iris. So in this case, I'll put myostat to close it. Yeah, but if you like if you like it, there is no harm. But I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. But the second point is totally totally agree. So you mean I, if the lens, if the haptic is broken yeah. during insertion, you continue or you change it? Yeah. <sighs> yeah. 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 Nothing will happen. Nothing will happen unless unless the cut edge is sharp. Mm -hmm. Then you you. Yeah. If it is sharp. From the core. Yeah. If it's not sharp, then you're okay. But if it's sharp, it might affect the the zonule. So. Yeah, I would I would inject it and and you know the right line. If you if you go back twenty years ago, I know someone, Roberto Zaldivar, uh, uh, when you have a large when he had a large lens, just cut it and put it. <laughs> oh. oh sorry, sorry, Masahapti Kalami. لا يا سيدي لا في ال في الحد الحقنا يا حقنا يا عم إحنا أقصد أقول إحنا في ال في ال في الآي سي إل متدلعين لأنه طيب أنا هقفل تليفوني بعد كده والله يا ظلم ظلم والله الطريق آي سي إل is not FDA approved the ICL is FDA approved. The Toric ICL is not LD approved. end of text. It's a Swiss product getting approved in the US of A. Oh, Allah will give you something better. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.